Let's now iterate a little more about the Hooke's law. You remember that any tensor can be decomposed into the spherical part and the deviatoric part. And this holds both for the stress tensor and for the strain tensor. The deviatoric part of the stress tensor, the, the, the spherical part of the stress tensor, is given as one third of the trace of the stress tensor, which is a, a, an invariant, which is what we call the mean stress. So the deviatoric part, the, the spherical part of the stress tensor is a hydrostatic te stress tensor which is given by the product of the mean stress, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, summed, divided by 3, or sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, divided by 3, times the identity tensor. And the remaining is the deviatoric part. Remember that. For the strain tensor, we can do the same decomposition, but the coefficient that multiplies the identity is turned out to be one third of the trace, but since the, th the trace is the volume deformation, volumetric deformation, this one third of E, E is the scalar that stands for the trace of epsilon, which is the volumetric deformation, plus the spherical part. So, if we have a relationship between the stresses and the strains in total values, the total amount of the stresses and the total amount of the strains. That looks like that way, this way or that way, the, the alternative way you have seen. What is that relation? Well, we just want to relate a spherical part with a strain, with a deviatoric part. So, is the mean value of the stresses, which determines the spherical part of the stresses, independent on the spherical part, on the deviatoric part of the strains, or not? Is the deviatoric part of the stresses dependent on the uh, spherical part of the strains, or not? Well, let's do that. We can do that. It's not that easy. It's just a matter of doing operations. So we start, I just will synthesize the, 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 the operation, we start from the constitutive equation, the Hooke's law that we have seen in terms of E and mu. Uh, we just do the trace of that. If we do the trace of that, we just obtain the volumetric uh, strain. And the trace of that, the trace is not affected by the scalar, so would be that scalar times the trace of this tensor, which is 3, plus 1 minus nu plus nu divided by E times the trace of this tensor. By definition, is three times the mean strains. So from that, we can just replace and obtain that this is three times the mean stress, this is three times the mean stress, we can solve for the mean stress, and we take the following. The mean stress is equal to a coefficient, which is that way, in terms of the Young modulus and the shear and the portion ratio, times the volumetric strain. So the first question, is that mean stress or that part of the stress tensor, the spherical part of the stress tensor, what is it dependent on? Well, it depends only on this figure. There is one coefficient the relation of the mean stress and the volumetric strain. What is that coefficient? That. And that coefficient, which has this shape in, or this form in terms of E and mu, can be also written in terms of lambda mu as lambda plus two-thirds of mu, is called the volumetric deformation modulus. So the volumetric deformation modulus, which also plays an important role in elastic behavior, is that coefficient that when multiplied by the volumetric strain, which is the spherical part of the strain, returns the spherical part of the stresses. Okay? But of course, that is not a new property of the material. That property depends on E and U or lambda mu, so we don't need to identify that experimentally specifically. We just, once we have lambda mu or once we have E and U, we can obtain K. But that is the spherical part of the Hooke's law. That says, that part says that the spherical part of the stresses and the spherical part of the strains are related, again, proportionally with an elastic material, which is called 
the volumetric deformation modulus. Okay? And it's the, it's the K. What about the other part, the, the deviatoric part? Well, again, we start from the, uh, the, the, the Hooke's law, okay? And in the Hooke's law, then, we replace the stresses by its spherical part and the deviatoric part. And the stresses here by the stress part and the deviatoric part. Now we operate. We operate, we operate, we operate, we operate, we operate. And finally, we obtain that the strains are equal to one third of the spherical strain, uh, the, the E times one, plus this term here, times the deviatoric part of the stresses. Okay? But now, replacing here the strain as the de as spherical part plus the deviatoric part, we obtain that this part here, this part here, is precisely the deviatoric part of the strain. So we obtain this equation here. The deviatoric part of the strains are just 1 plus nu times z, which is, by the way, uh, 1 over 2g, g being the shear modulus, times sigma prima. So final, finally, we obtain that the second question that I stated, what is the relation of sigma prime and this term here? Well, sigma prime is independent of, a, of e, just depend on epsilon prime. And how does it depend on? Uh, of and then the answer is it depends in this way just proportionally to, to G that is the so we can uh, split somehow we can uh, split the Hooke's law into two parts saying okay as for the spherical part of the stresses the stresses are proportional to the volumetric strain in a linear way defined by a coefficient which is the volumetric modulus k in that way. And then, and that's surprising, that's not so trivial, every component, this is component by component, every component of the deviatoric stresses is proportional to the corresponding component of the deviatoric strands in terms of twice the shear modulus. That is there. So this is nothing else than this equation, this equation, this equation, or, sorry, this equation, or the, or, or the Hooke's law, this equation, but now expressed in the parts, the counterparts, the spherical parts, and the deviatoric parts. And that's important sometimes to know, that they are proportional component by component. So the, component, the spherical component is proportional of the stresses, it's proportional to the spherical component of the strains, and every spherical com deviatoric component of the stresses mm -hmm. is proportional to any deviatoric component of the strains through the, the parameters k, the volumetric, the, 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 the modulus, the volumetric deformation modulus, and g, the shear modulus. Okay? Now, a look onto the elastic potential. The elastic potential, we have already seen that in the general, general, general case, uh, has this form, epsilon c epsilon. Look, if I say a, e, y equal a times x squared, what is the formula that you will imagine in the space, x, y? What is the shape of this curve? y equal a times x squared. Parabola. What type of parabola? A parabola that passes through the origin and is that way, right? Is that way. So this somehow is a parabola but in a multidimensional space. So if here I place the, er the, the internal energy and here of course, here I have nine dimensions because these are tensors that have six dimensions on this, six different dimensions. If I had, I mean in this six plus one, seven dimension space, which I cannot imagine. What I have is just a representation. I would have a parabolic, a, par a, 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 a parabola, okay, parabolic shape, passing through the origin. That says that, that for zero strains, when the material is undeformed, the energy, the internal energy is zero, okay? And then increases. Increases always positive. Look, this is always positive because C, I told you that this is a positive definite tensor. So this product is always positive. So the energy 
the, the internal the formation energy is always positive. It's never negative. Never. It's only zero at the undeformed state. Undeformed state. Okay? And what about the derivative of this function? You know that the derivative of this function, what is the derivative of this function? If I set a function y equal f of x, what would be the derivative of f with respect to x? Or of y with respect to x? The slope of the curve, right? So the slope of the curve, the slope of this, of this curve is precisely the stresses. So if I differentiate this with respect to epsilon, I obtain the stresses. And these stresses are the slope of this energy. So how much is this slope here, the stresses, for epsilon equals 0? For epsilon equals 0, for no strains, what are the stresses? Zero. That's the Hooke's law. The stresses are proportional to the strain. So this way, the, 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 the slope is here. And then, and then, as I increase the strains, I increase the stresses uh, according to that formula. OK? And by the way, if I now take the second derivative of this formula, if this was a parabola, y equal a times x squared, the second derivative is 2a. Or the parabola was y equal 1 half of a times x, x squared, the second derivative would be a. a is constant. That's what happens here. The second derivative of this curve is precisely, we saw it, that is precisely the tangent constitutive mod, uh, tensor. And in this multidimensional space, that second derivative is constant. Constant and positive definite. Okay? So, now, what is the expression of this elastic potential, again, in terms of the spherical and the diatonic parts? Well, the elastic potential we saw some slides before that look like that. One half of lambda of E squared times trace squared of epsilon, which is the volumetric strain plus mu epsilon epsilon. Okay, let's replace that. So let's replace, this is E, and E replace E as the spherical part, epsilon, sorry, as the spherical part and the deviatoric part. We do the product, and by doing this product, we realize that this is one half, one third of E squared plus epsilon prime, epsilon prime. So epsilon prime, we replace here, blah, 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 and we arrived that in terms of the spherical part, A E, of the, of the, of the strain tensor, and the deviatoric part, epsilon prime, the potential, the uh, internal energy of the strain energy, can be written as one half of K times E squared plus mu epsilon prime, epsilon prime. Okay? That's just, I mean, algebraic operation. So finally, in virtue of this decomposition, it's clear that there should be some relation which involves k and g, or k and mu. Mu is nothing else than g. So this is an alternative expression to that of the elastic potential in terms of k and mu. Okay? And as I told you, that energy is always is always positive. That's what we saw here. That's always positive, right? Whatever are the strains, whatever are the strains, u is also positive. What does it say about the values of k and mu? It says something. 